Okay, well today we're going to talk about how to estimate the population mean when we do not know sigma, which is our population standard deviation. This is actually a more realistic case. I told you that the last couple of minutes of class last time. I said that really, are we going to know the population standard deviation most of the time? Not in practical experience, you're gonna, you might approximate it every once in a while, but you're really not going to know it because you have to know this to even find that. You've got to know that. So maybe based on past experience, you do know what this is, but it's, it's rare. It's not going to happen all the time. So perhaps a more real life scenario is, how in the world are we going to estimate the population mean when we know absolutely nothing about it? And that's what this section is about. So this is perhaps a little bit more realistic. Uh, one thing the problem is, the, the one thing that we, we have to struggle on a little bit is, if you don't know sigma, you can't use a z-score. The requirements, they're not met. So if you go back and you check those requirements from the last section, it said random sample, great, and the next one was you know sigma. Do we know sigma? Nope. So we can't use a z-score, we can't use a z-critical value. That's a problem for us. Instead, what we're going to use we use a t-score. You know what? What was that again? A t-score? You've never heard of a t-score before. Instead, we use a T-score. A long time ago, there was this guy, he actually worked in a brewing factory, and uh, he didn't know, he wanted to do the, these experiments on, on beer to find out uh, different characteristics about them. But he, firstly, he didn't have large sample sizes. He didn't have more than 30 different vats to, to sample from. Uh, but he knew that the, the distribution would be normal, so you can use some of this stuff, we'll talk about that in a minute. But uh, finally, he didn't know the population standard deviation because, of course, you can't have the population of all, all beer all the time. So he had to come up with something new. So this guy, he wrote into a journal under the, the name of Student T. Student T. Uh, he, he used a pseudonym because he didn't want himself associated with this to do the beer crossover because he was using their, their information. So that's where we get the T distribution from. So Student T, this one guy wrote into a, a journal someday. As, long time ago, and that's where this is all coming from. Are you with me? So some guy did the work and actually calculated a new table for us. Here's what we need for a t-score. First thing, just like always, we absolutely have to have a random sample. Number two, besides the fact that we need a random sample, we've got to know that our sample is from a normal distribution, from a population that is normally distributed, or and has to be greater than 30. <coughs> Does that sound familiar to you? That's uh, the same thing that we, we just talked about. So, n is greater than 30 for sure. Or, if n is not greater than 30, you absolutely must have the sample coming from a population that's normally distributed. So, or, the sample is from a normally distributed population. So that's got to be somewhere. Either your sample size is more than 30 or the population is normally distributed. In the past, we used a z-score to, to represent this. We had, what's x-bar stand for? Everybody should know that. What's x-bar stand for? Sample mean. Sample mean, great. We would do sample mean minus population mean all over sigma over the square root of n. Does that look familiar to you, I hope? That was for those groups, right? For the average of a, of a sample. That was it. The problem is, 
we can't use a z-score in these contexts because of one thing. We don't have that. We don't have that piece of information. So instead, we're now going to translate that to a t-score. I think they use a lowercase letter t, but I can't write lowercase letters, so I use a capital T. So anyway, it's a t-score regardless. It's letter, letter t. Well, we, we're still going to be able to find a, a sample mean. That's fine. And that view, that's okay. That's our sample mean. We're comparing that to something. Uh, we're actually going to be estimating this. But here, right here, we can't use the population standard deviation because we don't know it. And we're not going to assume it. So what we're going to do is we're going to use S over the square root of n. What's S stand for? A sample. Sample what? What was this? What's that? Same thing. What is it? Standard deviation. Sure. This one's from a... This one's from a... That's from a long time ago. We haven't used that lower case letter S in a long time. But that S stands for a sample standard deviation. So are the formulas pretty much identical? Yeah. Only this is from a sample instead of a population. That's really the only difference between a z-score and a t-score in finding the actual value here. Now, <coughs> the critical values, of course, are going to be very similar. So critical values instead of z, we're going to have t's. But it's still going to be that alpha. Remember the alpha? What's alpha for a 90% confidence level? How much is alpha? For a 90. How much is alpha? You don't have to look it up. You should know. No, not the, not the critical value. I'm saying alpha. It's 0.1. 0.1, sure. If your confidence is 90%, your alpha is 0.1. If your confidence is 95%, what's your alpha? 0 0.05. 0 0.5, no, 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 that's 50%. How about your alpha for a 0.99? What's your alpha? 0.01. 0 0.01, sure. Those things have to add up to 1, right? They're complementary. So we split that because we get those two tails for our, our, our uh, confidence intervals. That's the same stuff that we've been talking about. So critical values given by t's instead of z's. That's basically all I'm saying there. Um, there's one more definition I need to give you. It's a definition called degrees of freedom. Here's how you find degrees of freedom. It means the degrees of choice uh, or, or, or choice in your sample. Here's degrees of freedom. We're going to signify it with a, a DF or abbreviated. It is N. <coughs> N stand for again? Sure. Sample size minus 1. Very easy formula. Easiest formula you'll ever get. N minus 1. Sample size minus 1. basically just your sample size minus one. So if I have a sample of 90 people, degrees of freedom would be 89. Okay, we just subtract one. It is not a hard thing. It's not a trick question. Sample size of 50 would give you degrees of freedom of? Everybody? Excellent. Awesome. We're all getting it now. Yeah. You subtract one from the number and that gives you your degrees of freedom. Why? Why does it work? I'll give you a simple example. Uh, if I'm picking Let's imagine this, all right? We're, we're talking about averages here. You with me? We're talking about averages. Uh, that sample, sample averages, sample means. True or false? If I pick 10 numbers, I can make them have an average of 100. True? Can you pick 10 numbers that have an average of 100? Sure. 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10. I'm sorry, 100, 100, 100, 100, 100, 100, 100. 100. That's 10 numbers that have an average of 100, right? You can always do that. You could pick uh, five 100 ones and five 99s. That would have an average of 100, right? Those are very simple examples, but here's the idea. If I give you nine numbers, so set in stone,
If I give you nine numbers set in stone, and I ask you for the last one, I say uh, the average of these things, you don't have to write this down, just, just watch, okay? If I say you're picking ten numbers out that have to have an average of 100, and I say these first nine, I don't care what they are. Do, can, do you believe me that it does not matter what these nine numbers are, that last number has to be one particular number to give you an average of 100. Does that make sense? So for instance, I'm going to pick random numbers here. Negative 3, 5, 13, negative 1, 10, uh, 43, 78, 21, negative 304, and positive 2. That's 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9. Is there a way to make these average out to 100? Absolutely. But would that number be set in stone? Yes. Absolutely. So these numbers, whatever I give you, I have nine choices for, for picking out whatever ten numbers are going to average up to 100. I have nine choices. I can make them whatever I want, but the last one will be set in stone. The last one can be nothing else besides one number. If I change any of these ones, that one would have to change. This one is dependent on the other nine choices. So if you choose nine things, the last one is set in stone. That means your degrees of choice, you have nine choices, but the last one will be guaranteed to be a certain value. Does that make sense to you? So that's where we get this degrees of freedom from. It says, yeah, okay, you've got almost the whole sample size worth of choice, but if you're trying to get a certain average, that last one's going to be set in stone. It's not going to move anywhere. Now people understood the idea of degrees of freedom. It's a, kind of a weird idea, right? Kind of a weird idea, but that's where we're getting that from. Okay, you ready? Ready for some, some real stuff, how to learn how to use the t-values? Good thing you're here today, right? So this is new. This is new stuff, finally. Let me give you a quick example. This is going to illustrate how to find a t-critical value. Let's say you have a sample of 23. from a normally distributed population. By the way, is that statement meaningful to you? Yes. If I didn't have this statement, would I be able to do anything? No. Why not? Because ah. So this 23, that's our, that's our N. This means that I can use this stuff. The requirements are met now because I have it from a normally distributed population. That's important. What I want us to do is find the critical value that's t alpha over 2 for a confidence level of 95%. Find a T critical value for confidence level of 95 percent. Okay, let's do this thing. Firstly, <coughs> can you tell me what my N is? How much is my N? Okay, how much is my alpha? Can you tell me what my alpha is, please? How are you finding point zero five? Sure, great, because those thing, two things are complementary. They have to add up to one. This is 0 0.05, that's great. You all with me on the alpha's 0 0.05? Mm -hmm. Okay. Can you tell me how much is my degrees of freedom? What's my degrees of freedom? How are you getting 22? 23 Yeah, you just subtract one from that. So degrees of freedom is the sample size minus one or 22. Now we're going to find t alpha over 2. That's our critical value. When I say critical value, that's, that's what that means. We're going to go ahead and we're going to find that. I need you to take out your tables. You know that pull-out sheet that you all have? Looks like this. Or it's in the back of your book. It's table A3. So find your A3 for me.
Can you see that? We hope if I have lights. Whoa! They just burn your retinas? And burn my retinas. That was crazy. Retinas are in your eyeballs, right, anatomy? That's what I thought. Okay. So we have this T distribution. Oh, it is a lowercase letter T. See, I, I told you, I just can't write lowercase. Anyway, so we have a T distribution. It says critical T values. That's exactly what we're looking for. Let's look at this chart. Just kind of, kind of look at it for a second. What's on the left-hand side? Hey, do you know how to find that now? So you're not looking up sample size. You're actually looking up degrees of freedom. T distributions are often, very often used for small sample size. I'll talk about why in just a bit. Okay, but most of the time your samples are under 30. You just have to know they're coming from a normal, normally distributed population. Are you with me on that? So most of the time they're under 30. No problem. Now, if you look up at the top, it says something weird. It says area in one tail, areas in two tails. I need you to understand that on our graph, we have a normally distributed curve, right? We have this bell-shaped curve. And we have how many tails? Two. Two tails. If we're dealing with a 95, I had you write this down for a reason. If we're dealing with a 95% confidence level, the alpha is 5%, right? 0 0.05. That's the area that's combined in both tails. Are you with me on this? If the area in both tails is 0 0.05, how much is in one tail? 0 0.025. Do you figure out how we get 0 0.025? Look what this says. If you're talking about the area in two tails, these things mean the same thing. It's just divided for you. Look at that. Area in two tails, our tails combined, is 0 0.05. You with me? Or if you want to think about it as one tail, how much area is in one tail? 0 0.025. These columns mean the same thing. Area in one tail would be 0 0.025, or the area in both tails combined would be 0 0.05. Either way, we're in this column. Raise your hand if you understand that. Good, okay, so for our confidence intervals, you can think about alpha as being in both tails. So this right here is your alpha. This is your alpha, and this is your alpha over two. On your table, if you want, you can go ahead and write alpha, alpha over two. Go ahead and write that right there if you'd like to. That's for your, and write confidence intervals above that little column. So right here, I'd be putting, on your paper, I'd be putting uh, confidence, Interval CI right here, and then put alpha, <coughs> alpha over 2. Or did I have that back? No, I had that backwards, I'm sorry. Uh, put alpha <coughs> here. My fingers are too fat. Put alpha here. <laughs> put alpha over 2 here. Put CI here. That's for confidence intervals only. Okie dokie. Y'all with me, folks. Uh, sorry about whatever this was. Anyhow. So let's go ahead. Let's do our T critical value. Can y'all tell me what was our degrees of freedom that we should be looking at here? 22. 22. Okay. So we're going to go down to 22. That's right here. We're going to go over to our either our alpha, which is this column or alpha over two, which is this column, it's the same thing. We're gonna go all the way down to the meetup, 22, that should be 2.074. Do you all find 2.074? You should have your table as well, be doing the same exact thing, 2.074, you with me? Now, stop. Think back to Z scores, okay? Think back <coughs> to Z scores. If I said, ignore this table, don't look at this table. If I said to you, hey, find me the critical value for a 95% confidence level, you would be telling me 1.96. You'd be telling me 1.96. You're with me for a 95% confidence level. What's a T distribution do? Is that bigger or smaller? Bigger. That means for the same level of confidence, you're going to have a wider spread, which means that your T distributions aren't as accurate. Why not? Because you do not know the population standard deviation. Does that make sense? You're estimating with a sample. That's why. That's why it's going to be a little bit wider. Now, I need you to look what happens. Okay, check this out. Look what happens for a very, very small sample. This would be a sample of two. You're not going to have a sample of one. Okay, that wouldn't that'd be irrelevant. You'd have all the information right there. But if you have a sample of two, look at that. That's your critical value. 
That's way bigger than 1.96, right? That's going to be a huge, huge spread. My arm, I almost fill up the whole screen with how, how wide that spread's going to be. That's crazy. But look what happens. As soon as you start getting bigger and bigger samples, what's happening to this critical value? Okay, now I have a critical thinking type question for you. We're thinking with critical value, so critical thinking fits right into this. As my sample size goes up, what do you think this number is going to approach? What do you think? Zero. No, not zero. Zero would mean you'd have no spread whatsoever. <coughs> not one. Two. Not two. Let me ask you another question. What's the critical value for a z-score when you know the population standard deviation? For a 95% confidence level. 1.96. It's for a z-score when you know the population standard deviation. You with me? Now, if you take samples big enough, it's going to be so large that that sample standard deviation is going to be pretty close to the population standard deviation, right? Pretty darn close. As you go higher and higher in sample size, look what happens. Look at the very bottom of your table. What's it say for, oh wow, it's a long way down there. Look at this. We're still in this column, right? This, is a, this was a 95% confidence level. Are you with me on that? This column right here. So we go, oh, two, two, two. Oh, we're in the ones. So it obviously it doesn't max out at two, right? That's just for a sample size of 61. We go down here, oh my, what's it getting close to? <coughs> Holy cow, why does it say N large? That means as you're getting really big, big samples. Why does that happen? Because as you take large samples, the sample standard deviation is really closely approximating the population standard deviation. Therefore, a T-score will automatically become a Z-score, value-wise, as we get big enough. Does that make sense? You sure you followed that? So are T-scores the same as Z-scores? No, clearly not. They change for every sample that you take. That's what's weird about them, right? You take a sample of 35, it's different than 36. It's different than 40. It's different than 25. That didn't happen with Z-scores. So for every different size of sample, you're going to have a different critical value. Are you going to really need to know how to read this chart? Yeah. yeah. Absolutely, you're going to need to know how to do that. Because for every different sample, you've got a different value. But as you get big enough, as your sample approaches, well, this says above 2,000, but as it's approaching infinity, really, is when we have our Z-score <coughs> exactly matching our T-score. That's how this thing works. For big enough, it, it works just fine. Look at this one. How about for, uh, that one look familiar? That's for 90. That's our 90 column. That one look familiar? Yeah. It's pretty close. 2.57, this is 7.6, but we should have 2.575 for z-scores, right? So it's really, really close. Okay. Would you please raise your hand if you understand how to find a T, T critical value? Good, that's the only new thing I gotta teach you. You know why? Because after we do a T critical value, everything else is almost exactly the same as what we did. This was 2.074 if I remember right. But after you find that, after you do your T critical value, which is the hardest part, you're gonna do the same exact thing with your E, the same exact thing with your confidence intervals, so it'll be exactly like your homework that you just turned in. Was it 2.074? Yeah. Okay, so we'll talk about our, our E, that's our margin of error. The E is going to look awfully similar to the E for our, our last section when we were estimating the population mean knowing the standard deviation for the population. We're still going to have a critical value, we're still going to have a standard deviation, and we're still going to have a sample size. But the only thing that, cha that doesn't change uh, using the letter is the sample size. N is N no matter what you're talking about. So when we're doing this, sure, we're going to have a critical value here, and we're going to be multiplying by something over the square root of N. Hey, tell me, thinking back to the last section, what normally would go here? For a... Good, and what symbol did we use to represent that? Sigma. For a population, it was sigma. Are you going to know sigma in this section? No. No. 
So we have to use a different standard deviation. The whole reason why we even need a T-score, because we're using not the population standard deviation, but the... And what letter represents that? S. Great. So the only difference here is that we're using S. Now, the critical value, can I use a T critical value or a Z critical value? Which one? T. T. Why? I don't know sigma. That's why we have S there, right? If we knew sigma, we'd have a Z. Z and sigma go together. T and S go together. Oops. That's not a T. There we go. Does the E look familiar to you? It's just a number, critical value, S, standard deviation over the square root of our sample size, N. That's all it is. And if that's the case, then our confidence intervals are exactly the same as last time. We're just going to take our x bar minus e and x bar plus e and surround our population mean with that. Because e is still the maximum difference between our point estimate, remember our point estimate, and our population parameter. It's still the maximum difference. So if I subtract it from the point estimate and add it to the point estimate, it's giving me that range of numbers to which I'm a certain level of confidence that, it's going to, that the actual population parameter is going to fall in that range. I've said that like 50 times now. But that's always the same interpretation. You okay so far? Now, I, I normally list out the steps, but honestly, the steps are exactly the same as the last one. Number one, you're going to check to see if your requirements are met. Same as last section. You checked that, right? For this, you, you need an N, well, obviously <coughs> random sample, or sample. The N has to be bigger than 30, or if it's not, it has to come from a normally distributed population. Second thing, or third thing, I guess, if you consider that random sample is, is number one, you have to not know sigma. Because if you knew sigma, there's a better way to do it. There's a more accurate way to do it. You with me on that? If you know sigma, you're using z-score. Because why? Hey, it, it's more accurate. You're going to get a better range of numbers. We just found out that t's are wider than z's. What would you rather have, a narrow range or a wide range? Narrow. narrow. You want to be more accurate. So if you had sigma, why are you using t? You're not going to do that. If you don't know sigma, you're left to only having a, this is your option. That's it, just t. So we're going to check those requirements. Sigma is not going to be known. The next thing you do is find your, t your uh, degrees of freedom because you're going to use that to find your T critical value. So one, requirements. Two, you're going to look up for your degrees of freedom. Three, that's going to let you find your T. And once you find your T, you're home free. You got E, you got your, your common sense. Would you guys like to do an example? You don't look so excited about the example. Oh, you're hurting my heart. This should be fun. We're, we're almost done with our class. We should be excited about every last example. There's not many left. <laughs> we're going to construct a 95% confidence interval for the age, for the average age of people denied a promotion. If you see these people, uh, they were there in this business, and this company would, would always promote young people, but not old people, because they figured, well, they're going to go away anyway, so we don't like promote them. So they were just promoting young people. And so these, these people filed a lawsuit and said, hey, you're, you're being ageist here. You know, we have just some amount of qualifications. Why are you not promoting us? So this is, this is where that comes from. So we're going to construct a 95% common set interval to find out the average age of people denied a promotion from this, this company, OK? And here was the information they got. In a random sample, of 23 people,
the average age was 47.0 with a standard deviation of 7.2. Circa 95% comes in for the average age of people for that promotion. The sample, 23 people. Average age was 47 with a standard deviation of 7.2. Assume this sample comes from populations that's normally distributed. Let's go ahead and let's see what we can do, what we can use. Firstly, can you tell me what my, let me use a different color here, what my N is? What is my N, <laughs> ladies and gentlemen? 23. 23? 23? Mm -hmm. Yes, 23. Absolutely. Hopefully 23. From my N, can you tell me my degrees of freedom? Remember, N does not equal degrees of freedom. So N, N is different than degrees of freedom. It's, it's actually different by exactly one all the time. What is my degrees of freedom then? 22. In fact, we just did that on the board. 22. OK, now, can you tell me, do I have an X bar? Do I have an X bar or do I have a mu? Zero. Where's it coming from? Is this average age from a sample or the population? Sample. Am I going to tell you the population for a, for a compensate interval? No. no, that's what we're trying to estimate. I mean, why would I tell you, hey, the mean age is 47 for the population? You wouldn't even have to do this, right? You're like, oh yeah, I know it's 47. Great. No, we're not going to do that. That'd be a waste of time. So the sample mean is 47. Here's the big one, okay? This is going to tell you what to do. I need to be ultra clear on this. You're going to look right here because it's always going to give you a standard deviation. Always. Unless you're dealing with the proportion. Remember, we're in the second half of this. First half was proportions. You only do one thing. What do you use for proportions? A Z or a T? Z. Z, no matter what. That's proportions. You, you just use Z. Over here in means, we have two scenarios. We have Zs and we have Ts. It all is based around this statement. Everything else can be worded exactly the same. But this statement right here is going to tell you whether you're using a Z or whether you're using a T. That's it. So in this statement, is this a population standard deviation or a sample standard deviation? In other words, is this a sigma or is this an S? And that's what you've got to know. If it's a sigma, you're going to be using which one, a Z or a T? Z. Z. If it's an S, if it's a sample standard deviation, you're going to be using a... That's it. If you can manage that, these compensation intervals are, are pretty easy, right? But the math is not hard on them. If you can manage that, then you can manage doing the test just fine, because you're going to get a whole lot of confidence intervals on your test, at least four, at least four confidence intervals. So if you can tell the difference between sigma and S, population standard deviation and sample, by reading the problem, you'll be just fine. If you can't, you're, you're going to mess up. You're going to do a Z when you should have a T, or a T when you should have a Z, and it's going to crazy on you. Right? So let's read real careful. It says, in a, a random, <coughs> sample. random sample of 23 people, the average age was 47. That's where we get our X bar. With A, with A, what's the with A mean? It says, in relation to that sample that I'm taking right there, in relation to the sample, it was 7.2. Is that a sigma or an S? S. Definitely an S. A sigma would have said this. It would have said, Assume the population standard deviation is. You, you hear the difference there? It'll say population standard deviation somewhere. It will sp specify it for you. It's not going to leave you in the dark. Okay, if it's population standard deviation, it will tell you that. If you don't have that, it's sample. You follow? Okay, that's, that's the whole idea here. So here we have not a sigma. Sigma, you'd go, nope, no sigma. 
There is no population standard deviation even said anywhere in this problem. We have an S. That's a 7.2. By the way, can we even use a T-score? Are the requirements met? We should be checking that. Firstly, do I have a random sample? Yeah. Boom, got it, random sample. Um, the second thing was, is my sample size greater than 30? No. Oh, no. So can I use it? Yes. Why? Comes from a population that's normally distributed. That's great. That's exactly what I need to see. Lastly, I would check to see if my sigma is known or unknown. If my sigma is known, I would be using a Z distribution for a critical value. Is my sigma known? No. No, my S is known. My sample is innovation. That means I'm using a T. So we're going to go ahead and continue this thing. We've already found the degrees of freedom. We've already done all this nice stuff. We're going to go ahead and continue to find our alpha and our t critical value. What is our, what's our alpha here, folks? Our alpha. 0.05. Cool. We now should have enough between these two things to find our critical value. We, we've already done this on the board, but take some time, go through it again. Look at your table right now. Look up your degrees of freedom, which should be 22. Look over to the appropriate column. In this case, you have the 0 .05 for your alpha. That's why I had you write that on the table, right? So you just follow that. What is your T alpha over 2, please? Yeah, we, we just did that example in, in class, but we get the same information right here. After you find that, man, you, you're set. I mean, you've got the T critical value. You've got your S. You've got your N. Now it's time to find your E. So I'd like you to do that now. Oh, one thing, one thing. Please watch this very carefully. You'll be close if you mess this up, but you won't be exact. I'll be looking for it. When you're doing the N, should I use 22 or 23? 23. 23. N's 23, degrees of freedom is 22. You use the degrees of freedom to find this one, but go back to your N for that one. This should be 23. Find it. Did you find it? How much did you get? 3.114. Anybody else get 3.114? Yes? Is it okay that that's greater than 1? Yes. We're not dealing with proportions anymore, so it doesn't really matter. Can say it again? 3.1. Let's just say 3.11. Okay, that's okay because look at it. our mean is in tenths. Let's leave it in. We can actually leave it in tenths if you want to for our E. That's fine. Because we're not dealing with the proportions, we don't need to go to like the third or fourth decimal place. That would be important because you're talking about percentages there. Here we're talking about years. 3.1 years is going to be just fine enough for us. We don't need 3.114 years. That would be like almost an hour. So we don't care. Uh, we want 3.1 years. Give it to me. Same as your average is given. You follow? Okay, cool. What do I do with that E? What now? Interval. Make up my interval. Go ahead and do that now.
Okay, so we should be taking x bar minus e, wrapping that thing around a mu, that's our population mean that we're trying to estimate here, x bar plus e. So we have our x bar that should be given to you already. That's going to be explicitly stated somewhere. You're not going to have to find it. We would have 47.0 minus 3.1. That's going to be less than our mu, which is less than 47.0 plus 3.1. So this is going to give us a range in years. Right here, you should get, well, what is that, 43.9? And 50.1? Now comes for the interpretation. Hopefully you have this thing interpreted in your mind, because we use the same interpretation now for at least three weeks, right? So the interpretation right here is, I don't know exactly what the population mean of ages of people being denied promotion is. I don't know what the population is for this company. Because my sample is only 23, right? I don't know what the population mean is. But I'm, how, how, what percent sure are we? 95% sure that it's gonna fall between these ages. So here's what this means for this company. You're 95% sure that the people who are being denied a promotion are between 43 and 50. Oh, 44, 44 and 50, right? That's, is that older than normal? I don't know, that's, that's for someone else to decide, but you can provide them that information. Okay, so it says, is this significantly different than like people being denied a promotion at 30? Yeah, absolutely. Most of these people, 95% of the people are being, or you're 95% sure that most of these people are gonna have an average age of uh, somewhere between 44 and 50, that's, that's older than, if that's older than all the other people get promotions, then that would, they'd probably be in big trouble right there. But at least now you can find the, the, the interpretation and give the information to someone else to make those decisions. So again, the, the interpretation is, I don't know exactly what the population average is of people being denied promotion, but I'm 95% sure it's going to fall within this range. That's the idea. How many people understood this example? Good deal. Very, very similar to before, right? Only difference is that T. That T is crucial, though. You've got to know when to use it. If you have the sigma, perfect. You got Z. If you don't have the sigma, you got S, you got T. Computation is exactly the same. Finding the numbers are a little bit different. Though. Notice that if you used a, if you did use a z-score, you're going to be pretty close, right? You're going to be pretty close to this, but it's going to be off right here by just a little bit, just a little bit, and just a little bit. That's not that's not good enough for us. We need to be pretty pretty precise on this stuff. If you used a z, it would be 1.96. That's not all that different. That's only different in the hunt well, about a tenth and a, a tenth. 11 hundredths difference, not much, but it will make a difference. Okay, last thing we can do here before we do one final example. Just like before, when we had a, a confidence interval, you should be able to break that up and find the, the X bar like we found the P hat, and find the E like we found the E last time. And really it was all just about whether you can take, to find X bar, the two bounds, add them together and divide them by two, basically averaging them. Do you remember doing that with the P hat? Do you? Hopefully you do. To find the, the x bar, x bar is right in between these two numbers. So if I add them up and divide by two, if I average them, it's going to give me x bar. So you take the upper, <coughs> minus the lower, divide by two. To find e, you take the upper, I'm sorry, plus the lower. I, I messed that up. Uh, do upper plus lower. I think I said plus, I broke minus. Minus the lower and divide by two. So in our case here, we take 27.218 plus 24.065 and divide by 2. That's going to give me x bar, whatever that is. To find the E, the maximum difference between those, that margin of error, you take the 27.218, you subtract the 24.065, and you divide by 2. And that's going to give you your E. Is that clear enough for you? You go ahead and do, do the math on your own. That's simple mathematics. Uh, but that's about, about all we can do. We'll do one more example on this next time. So we're doing one last example about confidence intervals. This is, this is it, folks. After this, we get into hypothesis testing, and we are rolling. Good stuff after this. So in a random sample of babies born to cocaine-using mothers, the average weight was found to be 2,700 grams with a standard deviation of 645 grams. Construct a 99% confidence interval for the population average birth weight. 
the first thing we got to do is determine what section of confidence intervals we're in. Are we dealing with proportions here? Is there anything to do with success versus failure? Anything like that? No, we're not calling you know, cocaine baby success. That's a horrible, horrible thing. So that's, that's not good. So we, we don't have successes versus failures. We don't have any sort of proportion. We have averages going on. You with me? So we're talking about averages. So instead of dealing with proportions, we're over here in this section averages. And in averages, we have one of two categories. We have, we know the population standard deviation or we don't know the population standard deviation. If we read through this, let's try to identify some things here. Firstly, the most important thing is do you have, a, well, do you have a standard deviation? Does it say that? Yes. Yeah, so you're going to have a standard deviation in these problems. It's just you need to determine whether it's the population or the sample. If it's the population standard deviation, it will say specifically the population standard de deviation is assumed to be or assume the population standard deviation is somewhere it's going to say population standard deviation up, up there. Does that say that here? No. So do we know the population standard deviation? No. Definitely not. Definitely not. What is this standard deviation then? No. So is that sigma or S? S? That is S. That is exactly right. So we know a few things right now. Firstly, do you know, let's see, um, oh, you know what, I didn't tell you what the sample size was. Uh, sample of, let's say, 190. Hundred ninety babies. Babies. Do you know N? What does N stand for? Sample size. Great. So N is 190. Do you know the mu? Do you know the mu? <clears throat> Why not? Why don't we know the mu? <laughs> hey, if you knew the mu, you wouldn't even be doing this problem because you would know the mu. Right now what you're trying to do is estimate the mu. Are you clear on that? Why would you be estimating the mu if you knew the mu? That, that'd just be silly. That, that'd be dumb. Uh, we wouldn't want to do that. So of course we don't know the mu. That's what we're trying to estimate. So we, we don't know that. What do we know? Good. How much is x bar? And of course that came from the sample, then average was 2700. Okay. And you said we knew sigma or we knew s. Which one? S. Okay. Sure. The 645, that is our, our s. Now is the time when you determine whether you're going to be using a z-score or a t-score, and it's all based right here. It's not based on this. It's not based on this. It's based on what that letter is. If that's a sigma, what do you use? If, if that was a sigma, the candle, what you use a Z. Is that a sigma? No, it's an S. What do you use now? T-score. That's the determination. I walked you through that last part of class, right? I had you follow that chart down. So this is, this is S. That means we're going to be using a, a T critical value. But there's one more thing that we need that we don't need with a Z that we do need with a, a T. What is it? So that's right under here, degrees of freedom. What is it? 189. Okay, that's our first step. Identify all these letters. I think we have all of them listed. The next thing we got to do, find your critical value. So this is like step one. Check to make sure your, your requirements are met. Step two is let's see if we can find our T in this case critical value. By the way, what is your... .01. Wow, I didn't even finish it. Because you're good today. You're on top of the, on top of the game. Yeah, .01 is your alpha. That's the complement of your confidence level. So we have .01, that's stemming from a 99% confidence interval. Are you with me on that? Yeah. Very good. Now, take out your tables. Okay. We're going to look at this together. over that table, that these numbers are kind of, kind of small, I'll zoom in in just a moment. Your degrees of freedom was listed on the left. You should have used this column a whole lot last homework, right, that you, that you just used. By the way, did they throw in any Z scores or were they all T scores? They threw in some Z scores. Did they throw in some Z's? 
at the beginning. Just to, for you to determine between, right? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. But then all the problems should have had to do with T-score. Yeah. If you use Z-score on your homework, you better take that homework back today and change that. <laughs> so over here on the left-hand side, we start seeing these these degrees of freedom, but but down here past 40, notice past 40 how it, it goes up by 5 and then by 10 and then ultimately by 100. Do you see that? Yeah. That's because as you're getting closer and closer to these large sample sizes, your T-score is really starting to approximate your Z-score, right? And, and so it's getting really, really close. And so they can afford to make these jumps. I mean, look at that. Between 90 and 100 is only off by 4 thousandths. That's not much. Between 1,000 and 2,000 is only off by 2 thousandths. That's not much at all. Okay? That's only a little little bit. So the, the difference between sample sizes as you get really large doesn't make that much of a difference. So whether we have a degrees of freedom of 189 or 2, what, what was our degrees of freedom? Wasn't it 189? If we had a degrees of freedom of 189 versus a degrees of freedom of 200, is it really going to make that much of a difference? Not, not really. I mean, those things are very close sample size wise. So when you have a degrees of freedom that's not listed specifically on your chart, small sample size, yes, it matters a whole bunch. One, being off by one when you're way up there makes really different T values, T critical values. But down here it doesn't. So when you're dealing with like 189, what's 189 closer to, 100 or 200? Pick the 200. Okay, pick the 200. So, by the way, looking back at the top, can you read which column we're in? Are we in this column? No, that would be an 80% confidence interval. That's the area of two tails. This one would be a 90%. Yes? This would be a 95%. True? This would be a 90, 98%. That's a 98% confidence interval right there. This is your 99. Why do we say that? There's, there's your alpha right there. Didn't I put off to the side that this was alpha and this is alpha over 2 for you? So if this is our alpha, we have 0.01. That's why I had you run on the board. You're going to go all the way down, do this on your table. Look up your alpha in correspondence with the appropriate degrees of freedom, which everyone's closest to, and then give me my T critical value. Do that on your own. Don't say it loud. Have everyone do it. And what is it? How many were able to find that? <coughs> now, just to refresh your memory, if we deal with a 99% confidence interval with a Z score, this is 2.575. That number should be like in your head, right? So this is going to be a little bit wider than a 99% confidence interval with Z score. That would be if we had known the population standard deviation. So here it's a little bit wider because we don't know that. We don't know the spread of the population. What now? Formula for margin of error. Margin of error, great. So find me your E. That's that one. Really, from here on out, it's just plugging in numbers. Honestly, the key part in doing this is knowing whether you use T or C. That's it. Have you found your E? Have you found your E? 645 divided by the square root of 190, then you multiply that by 2.601 in this particular case, and you get how much? Wait, what, what again? No, what was the first part? 121.71. Now that seems kind of large, but when you think about it, the, I mean the average weight was 2,700 grams, right? That's, that's large, with a standard deviation of 645. So your margin of error when you do with means can be almost anything there. It just depends on what your, your context is.
What do you do now? Do you leave it? No. 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 Yeah, we can find the interval. So the way we find our interval is we take the point estimate. Remember what a point estimate is? It comes from a sample. Minus E, which is the maximum difference between your point estimate and your population parameter. So that gives you a range that gives you the furthest bounds that you could be away from your population parameter, which is in this case, what goes in the middle of this? Yeah, yeah why not P? Because it's not a proportion. Yeah, we're not dealing with portions anymore, we're dealing with averages. And the interpretation, once you find this, which you should be working on right now, go ahead and do that on your own. The interpretation is you don't know exactly what the, the population mean for cocaine babies is. You don't, you don't know. But you're 99% sure it's going to fall within these two intervals, or these two, two, this range. Why is that important? Well, if you're producing something that's, that's geared towards helping these, these children, these, these unfortunate children, well, then you're going to want to make sure that it holds up to most of the kids, right? By far most of the kids. You don't want to make something that only helps 20% of these cocaine babies. Maybe it's something that, that weighs them accurately or something, I don't know, some sort of drug that is, is uh, based on their weight. You want to produce that drug that says, okay, give this do dose to them right when they're born. It'll help them out a lot. It'll help 99% of these kids. Okay, the 1%, we need to find something else for them. But 99%, we're pretty, we're 99% we're sure it's going to help these babies from that range. Does that make sense to you? Okay. So we got our, we got our mean, which is our, and we'll subtract the 121.71. And we'll add it. What do you get on the left interval? Left, uh, sorry, left bound for the interval. Like this. I mean, like this. <laughs> okay, good. I think I can do this one. So given this information, you're not positive, you're not positive that the actual population mean is going to fall within this range, but you're 99% sure it is. That's enough to make a good decision, right? That's enough to say, I'm going to produce this one item that I'm 99% sure it's going to work uh, for, for these babies, because you're pretty sure the average is, is falling within it. That was supposed to change the margin of error, like the, um, we were supposed to round it according to <coughs> Yeah, you can. Uh, really, we're, we have too many decimal places here. You could easily do a 0.3 and a 0.7. Right? You don't want to get too much off from, from that. So if you're using the rounding rule, then yes, that's perfectly appropriate. So we round at the last step? Or yeah, round the last step. Like instead of 121, it really wouldn't matter since you're adding it and subtracting it. That, that doesn't make that much of a difference. Uh, if you're one decimal place past what your mean, what your information is giving you, then you'll always be okay. The problem is, is that if this was like uh, 2,700 point something something, and you rounded to the tenth here, that would be a problem. Okay, that would be, awful. or it could be potentially off a little bit. How many people understood our example here? Good deal. Very good. Now, this ends the part that's going to be on your test on Monday. Right now, we're going to get into the last chapter that we really look at in depth. We might go back into a couple sections that, if you've noticed, we've, we've skipped a couple of them. Uh, we might go back and do that last week of school. But for right now, we're going to talk about Chapter 8. <coughs> chapter 8 is, is what you try to get to in statistics. Chapter 8 is it. It is called hypothesis testing. It's what we worked all this semester to get to. It's the exciting part. It's the part that you're actually going to see, oh, this is actually useful. Are you starting to see more and more use in this stuff as we go through our semester? <coughs> At the beginning, you're like, why would I want to put data in a table? I don't care. I don't care about this freaking data. I don't know. But now, we're actually able to make decisions and determine whether something's a good choice or a bad choice based on actual factual data. That's important. <coughs>